Well, folks, we've done it. We've finally reached that part in the series where it's time to talk about one of the most interesting and illustrious characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, and the one true king of Westeros, Daemon. So let's dive in. As you can see, I've put on some more appropriate apparel and backdrop for us to discuss this topic over. We've gone over a lot of things in this series. We started by discussing Varys and Illyrio and their plan, and young Griff, and then we started talking about who Varys was, and took a look at a Varys reading, and tried to figure out a little bit more about the character himself, and now we're going to loop back around to talk about one of the things that connects all of this stuff together in the very disparate plot of Varys and Illyrio. And that is the Blackfires. So who are these guys, and what connects them to the Varys and Illyrio plot, and why do people think young Griff is probably a Blackfire? And then, finally, I promise, we're going to tie it all back into the Faceless Men and that White Raven that I kept bringing up. So, first off, who are the Blackfires? Well, there was this character called Aegon IV, also known as Aegon the Unworthy, and he had a lot of illegitimate children. Bastards, if you will. And upon his deathbed, he thought it would be a nice thing to, well, legitimize all the bastards. And this created a series of complications, because he had given one of his illegitimate children the Sword Blackfire, the legitimate markings of the true king of Westeros. And there was also some rumors going around that may or may not have some veracity to them that Prince Daron II, the heir apparent, was in fact himself a bastard and the illegitimate son of the Dragon Knight, one of the King's Guard members and brother to the King himself, Aegon IV. There's also some interesting politics here involving Dorne and potentially even the Dragon X gene if you buy into those theories, but we're not going to talk about that so much right now. For our purposes, we need to know that the Blackfire Rebellion was very close to successful, however ultimately thwarted with the death of Daemon Blackfire and his two eldest sons at the Redgrass Field. This kicked off a series of uprisings and future wars that would be known as the Blackfire Rebellions. And a numerous Blackfire claimants, also sometimes referred to as the Blackfire Pretenders, would each make varying attempts to reclaim the throne of Westeros, to little success. Enter the Golden Company. The Golden Company was founded by Aegor Rivers, another great bastard of Aegon IV, and a devoted retainer to Daemon Blackfire. He actually married one of Daemon's daughters, Kala Blackfire, so you can tell they had a pretty close relationship and they were interested in maintaining their alliance. Bittersteel went on to found the Golden Company. It would seem explicitly to topple the regime of Westeros and restore a Blackfire to the rightful place on the throne. And though the Golden Company has thus far been unsuccessful in fulfilling its purpose, the company still exists and is quite strong and is a critical part of Varys and Illyrio's plan to put young Griff on the throne. So... This should immediately raise a bunch of questions. Why is a company founded with the explicit purpose of deposing Targaryens being used to put a Targaryen on the throne? Has so much time just passed that the company has lost its original purpose? Have they decided that maybe a Targaryen is still a dragon, and as long as they get to return home, it's kind of whatever? Or, is the company fulfilling the role that it was originally created to fulfill, and is the Skull of Bittersteel watching over the completion of plans many generations in the making? Well, as it turns out, there would appear to be more than enough in-text and even some out-of-text evidence to clue us into the fact that Varys, Illyrio, and Young Griff are all involved in the Blackfire cause, and that Young Griff himself is most likely of Blackfire descent likely through a female line, and I'd like to point out here that Daemon Blackfire actually has two potential daughters this line could come from, at least as far as I've been able to tell snooping around the various charts. So let's try to tackle all of this evidence in totality, and see if we can narrow down whether or not Young Griff really is a Blackfire or not. And to do so, we're going to hit up five major areas of discussion. The Golden Company itself, Varys and Illyrio's alliances within Westeros, Varys and Illyrio's alliances outside of Westeros, various Blackfire artifacts, including the Sword Blackfire and the Blackfire Dragon Eggs, and some more meta stuff both within and outside the text.
The Golden Company was reputedly the finest of the free companies. Founded a century ago by Bittersteel, a bastard son of Aegon the Unworthy. When another of Aegon's great bastards tried to seize the Iron Throne from his true-born half-brother, Bittersteel joined the revolt. Daemon Blackfire had perished on the Red Grass Field, however, and his rebellion with him. Those followers of the Black Dragon who survived the battle yet refused to bend the knee fled across the narrow sea. Among them, Daemon's younger sons, Bittersteel, and hundreds of landless lords and knights who soon found themselves forced to sell their swords to eat. Some joined the Ragged Standard, some the Second Sons or Maiden's Men. Bittersteel saw the strength of House Blackfire scattering to the four winds, so he formed the Golden Company to bind the exiles together. From that day to this, the men of the Golden Company had lived and died in the disputed lands, fighting for Mir or Lice or Tyrosh in their pointless little wars and dreaming of the lands their fathers had lost. They were exiles, and the sons of exiles, dispossessed and unforgiven, yet formidable fighters still. Starting off, I'd like to take a look at two sections from A Dance with Dragons that both clue us into who the Golden Company is comprised of, especially in its leadership, and what their reaction to the reveal that young Griff is allegedly Aegon Targaryen was actually like. The high officers of the Golden Company rose from stools and camp chairs as they entered. Old friends greeted Griff with smiles and embraces, the new men more formally. Not all of them are as glad to see us as they would have me believe. He sensed knives behind some of the smiles. Until quite recently, most of them had believed that Lord John Connington was safely in his grave, and no doubt many felt that was a fine place for him, a man who would steal from his brothers in arms. Griff might have felt the same way in their place. Sir Franklin did the introductions. Some of the sellsword captains bore bastard names, as Flowers did. Rivers, Hill, Stone. Others claimed names that had once loomed large in the histories of the Seven Kingdoms. Griff counted two strongs, three peaks, a mud, a mandrake, a lusten, a pair of coals. Not all were genuine, he knew. In the free companies, a man could call himself whatever he chose. By any name, the sellswords displayed a rude splendor. Like many in their trade, they kept their worldly wealth upon their persons. Jeweled swords, inlaid armor, heavy torques, and fine silk were much in evidence, and every man there wore a lord's ransom and golden arm rings. Each ring signified one year's service with the Golden Company. Mark Mandrake, whose pox-scarred face had a hole in one cheek where a slave's mark had been burned away, wore a chain of golden skulls as well. The Stricklands had been part of the Golden Company since its founding. Harry's great-grandsire had lost his lands when he rose with the Black Dragon during the first Blackfire Rebellion. Gold for four generations, Harry would boast, as if four generations of exile and defeat were something to take pride in. So we can see that despite generations passing, the Golden Company has maintained an extremely strong loyalty and lineage connection to the Blackfire cause. New members have been brought in, but the old rivalries and old connections really define the company and most importantly, its leadership. And with that, let's take a brief look at how this leadership reacted to the reveal. No man could have asked for a worthier son, Griff said. But the lad is not of my blood, and his name is not Griff. My lords, I give you Aegon Targaryen, first-born son of Rhaegar, Prince of Dragonstone, by Princess Elia of Dorne. Soon, with your help, to be Aegon, the sixth of his name, King of the Andals, the Royanar, and the First Men, and Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Silence greeted his announcement. Someone cleared his throat. One of the coals refilled his wine cup from the flagon. Goris Adorian played with one of his corkscrew ringlets and muttered something in a tongue Griff did not know. Laswell Peak coughed. 
Mandrake and Lothston exchanged a glance. They know, Griff realized then. They have known all along. He turned to look at Harry Strickland. When did you tell them? Now to me, this reveal is more than a little bit suspicious. But I think the biggest highlight here is the fact that the Lord Captains of the Golden Company don't seem super stoked on a Targaryen cause. And their exchanges certainly seem to reveal they know more about the scenario than they are willing to tell, and certainly more about the scenario than Harry Strickland is letting on. We should remember that Griff is as much of a dupe of the Varys cause as he is an agent of it. And someone here is clearly being duped. Is it the Golden Company? I would argue no. Our good friend Illyrio has some rather interesting things to say about the Golden Company and their willingness to join his cause in the first place. And several chapters before the weirdness we just saw, he attempts to pitch to Tyrion an explanation for why the Golden Company has championed a Targaryen cause. However, his words speak even more deeply in double meaning, in my opinion, to the loyalties of the Golden Company to House Blackfyre. The Golden Company marches toward Volantis as we speak, there to await the coming of our queen out of the east. Beneath the gold, the bitter steel. I had heard the Golden Company was under contract with one of the free cities. Mere, Illyrio smirked. Contracts can be broken. There is more coin and cheese than I knew, said Tyrion. How did you accomplish that? The Magister waggled his fat fingers. Some contracts are written in ink and some in blood. I say no more. After all, the Golden Company does have a contract writ in blood, just not to House Targaryen. Alright, so if there's evidence that the Golden Company are still die-hard Blackfire supporters and that they're likely the ones doing the duping of Griff, what other evidence can we look to in the book series to clue us into the idea that the Varys and Illyrio cause is actually the Blackfire cause? Well, it's time for us to look at one of Varys' hubs of intelligence within the Seven Kingdoms, the Inn at the Crossroads, and more specifically the house that dominates the Inn at the Crossroads, a house that previously fell from grace in the Blackfire Rebellions. I am of course talking about House Heddle. And so for a brief examination of House Heddle's position within this entire equation, we will turn to the Duncan Egg novella The Mystery Knight. Dunk got his first good look at Sir Tomart Heddle while searching for egg amongst the crowds about the lists. Heavy set and broad, with a chest like a barrel, Lord Butterwell's godson wore black plate over boiled leather, and an ornate helm fashioned in the likeness of some demon, scaled and slavering. His horse was three hands taller than thunder and two stone heavier, a monster of a beast armored in a coat of ringmail. The weight of all that iron made him slow, so Heddle never got up past a canter when the course was run, but that did not prevent him from making short work of Sir Clarence Charlton. As Charlton was borne from the field upon a litter, Heddle removed his demonic helm. His held was broad and bald, his beard black and square, angry red boils festered on his cheek and neck. Dunk knew that face. Heddle was the knight who growled at him in the bedchamber when he touched the dragon's egg the man with the deep voice that he'd heard talking with Lord Peak. A jumble of words came rushing back to him. Beggar's feast you've laid before us. It's the boy, his father's son. Bitter steel, need the sword. Old Milkblood expects. Is this boy his father's son? I promise you, Blood Raven is not off dreaming. Is this boy his father's son? I think that particular passage is quite insightful, and you can probably see all the various pieces falling into place here. But we're not done yet looking through these various strains of Blackfire connection. Interestingly, the Inn at the Crossroads, which is currently occupied by House Heddle, is also the site of the Black to Red Dragon story, where the Lord of House Derry, upon seeing a black iron clanking dragon hung at the inn, demanded the dragon be destroyed. It was then thrown into the river in pieces, where eventually the pieces washed up, now rusted and looking red. No, said Septon Marybord. When the smith's son was an old man, a bastard son of the fourth Aegon rose up in rebellion against his true-born brother and took for his sigil a black dragon. These lands belonged to Lord Derry then, and his lordship was fiercely loyal to the king. The sight of the black iron dragon made him wroth, 
so he cut down the post, hacked the side into pieces, and cast them into the river. One of the dragon's heads washed up on the quiet isle many years later, though by that time, it was red with rust. This has been taken by many to be a fairly obvious metaphor for young Griff's transformation from a black dragon to a red, as he presents himself as a legitimate Targaryen, as opposed to a Blackfire. So how does the Inn at the Crossroads, with its deep Blackfire connection, connect to Varys and Illyrio? Well, as previously stated, the Inn appears to be a hub for the Varys cause, with various Varys agents, including Bronn and Shay, hanging out in and around the Inn, as well as the Inn being a frequent stopping location for Yorin. The Inn may also be acting as a convenient stashing location for Varys, as it is where Gendry is currently located. Now, a third interesting little through line I'd like to draw here that may or may not be as significant as the others, but one that I thought was worth bringing up, is the Tyrashi connection. Damon Blackfire was married to Rohan of Tyrosh. The Tyrashi then attempted to marry the blood of the Archon ship to Westerosi noblemen again, both time the men in question were the heirs apparent to the throne at the time. And we notice the brother of the Archon of Tyrosh happens to be friends with Illyrio. This to me implies that the Tyrashi may still have some vested interest in this cause, and they're more likely to support the Blackfires as that's who they chose the first time around. And while the Tyrashi connection is admittedly somewhat small and tangential, it does potentially tie into our much larger and much less tangential upcoming section here, and that involves not only the sword Blackfire, but the Blackfire dragon eggs. The Cushing deep dive that was done by the Redditor who made the original post is pretty extensive, and there's no way I could cover that without doing like a full episode on it, so I'm focusing here on certain excerpts. The Cushing stuff and speculation around it also is kind of tied into Fire and Blood and the other texts, obviously, so this touches on some of that as well, and you may find it useful to just go directly read Fire and Blood to get more of a better picture for yourself. To cover this topic in brief, however, we're going to have to talk about three different things. One is Alyssa Farman and the theft of the three dragon's eggs that everyone now currently believes are Daenerys' dragon's eggs. Number two is the Cushing Library leaks and the reveal that House Blackfire, during the time of Melee's the Monstrous, had a clutch of dragon's eggs. At least, in the drafts. And there's even a ritual to revive the eggs that's, well, kinda sorta similar to Khal Drogo's Pyre Death. And the third little piece here is Quickfinger from the Blackfire Rebellion, a thief who was supposed to steal some dragon's eggs who failed. So, what's all going on here? Well, it appears that House Blackfire would like to attain at least two of three potential symbols for legitimacy of House Targaryen. One, the Sword Blackfire. Two, Clutch of Dragon's Eggs, hopefully some dragons. And potentially the Crown of Aegon the Conqueror, another artifact the Blackfires may like to get their hands on. So as you can see, there's some pretty common themes here, and there is a chance that what the Cushing Library leaks are indicating is that these dragon's eggs that were stolen by Alyssa Farman and sold to the Sealer of Bravos may actually have ended up in the hands of Illyrio. If true, this shows a deep Blackfire connection, one so deep perhaps that George R. R. Martin felt the need to tone down the amount of Blackfire-related scenes in A Feast for Crows. And to tie this back to Tyrosh and any other potential onlookers or lurkers at the Daenerys Drogo wedding, these eggs may have a double function. They may also be indicators of a loyalty to the Blackfire cause. They could be evidence to onlookers that Varys and Illyrio are indeed Blackfires. Another treasure of House Blackfire that has mysteriously gone missing in our story, but that Lost a Feast for Crows chapters reveal is most likely in the possession of Varys and Illyrio, or the Golden Company at this point, is the sword Blackfire, the very same sword it seems Tom Heddle was concerned about in The Mystery Knight, and the very same sword bore by Damon Blackfire. If you'd like a little bit more on this section as well, there is a very good video by YouTuber Quinn the GM that you can go take a look at to kind of fill in the blanks for you. Quinn's video covers all the background stuff in great detail, as well as presenting a very cool perspective. And I'll actually show you one of my favorite parts of the video right now. In the season one finale, there's a line from Otto Hightower that seems to have some significance, at least symbolically, to the future story of A Song of Ice and Fire. When Rhaenyra and Otto have their confrontation on the bridge at Dragonstone, Otto informs her that Aegon has already been made king. He insists that, quote, Aegon Targaryen sits the Iron Throne. He wears the Conqueror's crown, wields the Conqueror's sword, has the Conqueror's name. He was anointed by a septum of the faith before the eyes of thousands. Every symbol of legitimacy belongs to him. Again, if you get the opportunity, please go check out the video. 
All in all, however, it seems likely that what was revealed in the Cushing Library, as well as several other tangents throughout the various texts of our story, when gathered together, all point towards Varys and Illyrio being potential blackfires. So while I didn't really know what to call this section, I wanted to focus in on two ideas. One of which being that George R. R. Martin began writing in the Duncan Egg novellas, and weaving the Blackfires in as an intricate part of their storyline, not too far around the time he was writing A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons, and he was developing these ideas as he does in his Gardener way. So I would say that there's a pretty strong argument, and I've heard this argument from within the fandom, that George R. R. Martin weaving in the Blackfires to Duncan Egg and weaving them into the universe in general is something that's occurring at the same time he's weaving in Aegon because they are part of the same thing. I personally like this idea and think it's not too far-fetched to assume that while he was developing one storyline, he began bleeding into the other and used it to build towards his developing ending. Secondly, I'd like to put forth something I noticed surrounding Saivaz pieces. So make of this what you will, but check out these series of readings. By the time she was ready, dusk had fallen. Arian had thought that Hota would escort her to the Tower of the Sun to hear her father's judgment. Instead, he delivered her to the Prince's Solar, where they found Doran Martell seated behind a Saivas table, his gouty legs supported by a cushioned footstool. He was toying with an onyx elephant, turning it in his reddened, swollen hands. The Prince looked worse than she had ever seen him. She seated herself across the Saivas table from her father. I did not give you leave to sit. Then call Hotel back and whip me for my insolence. You are the Prince of Dorne. You can do that. She touched one of the Saivas pieces, the heavy horse. Have you caught Sir Gerald? He shook his head. Her father plucked up a Saivas piece. I must know how you learned that Quentin was abroad. Your brother went with Cletus Ironwood, Maester Kendry, and three of Lord Ironwood's best young knights on a long and perilous voyage with an uncertain welcome at its end. He has gone to bring us back our heart's desire. She narrowed her eyes. What is our heart's desire? Vengeance. His voice was soft, as if he were afraid that someone might be listening. Justice. Prince Doran pressed the onyx dragon into her palm with his swollen, gouty fingers, and whispered, fire and blood. Now in her sample chapters, Ariane is on her way to meet up with Aegon's forces, and she is accompanied by knights, that is to say, heavy horse. They then hear rumors of elephants in the rainwood. And then of course we have young Griff, the black dragon. And while I think individually these little tidbits could potentially be written off, in totality, weighed with the other evidence we have, I think once again, we are seeing our author point us in a certain direction. So, thus far we should be noticing a few trends. The Varys and Illyrio cause seems to be comprised of Blackfire supporters, working with Blackfire supporters in Westeros. They appear to be bullshitting, at least bullshitting Tyrion and Jon Connington. And we can point to numerous in-book and numerous out-of-book clues that all seem to tell us that Aegon isn't really a Targaryen and is likely a Blackfire. Admittedly, there is much more I could say about the topic, however, there's already a lot of sections I decided to cut from this video, so instead, I'd like to recommend you go check out this video by Company of the Cat, an excellent and highly underappreciated video, and these two videos, if you have not already seen them, by Alt-Shift-X. There is indeed a strong case that young Griff is a Blackfire. However, while all the evidence may point this way, this really leads us back to the original question we started the series off with. Why? Why are they doing this? What would make Varys and Illyrio, two seemingly non-Westerosi individuals who shouldn't have that much concern with Westeros, be interested in House Blackfire? Well, I think to start answering that question, we have to look at passages like this one. Magister Illyrio gave him a curious look. I did not dream my little friend was so devout. The dwarf shrugged. A relic of my boyhood. I knew I would not make a knight, so I decided to be High Septon. That crystal crown adds a foot to a man's height. 
I studied the holy books and prayed until I had scabs on both my knees, but my quest came to a tragic end. I reached that certain age and fell in love. A maiden? I know the way of that. Illyrio thrust his right hand up his left sleeve and drew out a silver locket. Inside was painted a likeness of a woman with big blue eyes and pale golden hair streaked with silver. Sarah. I found her in a lysine pillow house and brought her home to warm my bed, but in the end I wed her. Me, whose first wife had been a cousin of the Prince of Pentos. The palace gates were closed to me there ever after, but I did not care. The price was small enough for Sarah. How did she die? Tyrion knew that she was dead. No man spoke so fondly of a woman who had abandoned him. A Bravosi trading galley called at Pentos on her way back to the Jade Sea. The treasure carried silk and saffron, jet and jade, scarlet samite, green silk, and the Grey Death. We slew her oarsmen as they came ashore and burned the ship at anchor, but the rats crept down the oars and paddled to the quay on cold stone feet. The plague took two thousand before it ran its course. Magister Illyrio closed the locket. I keep her hands in my bedchamber, her hands that were so soft. Now after hearing that passage, you may have correctly surmised that I am pointing towards the theory that Varys and Illyrio are in fact related to the Blackfire cause through blood. Broadly speaking, this theory contains two potential ways in which they can be connected by blood. One, that Sarah, Illyrio's wife, and Aegon's actual mother, as far as the theory goes, is a Blackfire. However, there's a second layer to this theory that I think fits in very well, and that is that Varys himself is a Blackfire. Now, when I was attempting to summarize the nuances of this theory, I was having a little difficulty. And just as I was getting so frustrated that I was about to just give up and roll up a fatty, I got a call from my good friend Dr. Dre. Now, as you know, Dre has helped me out in the past mixing up some tracks that help explain a few of the things that I had a hard time going over. And wouldn't you know it, he happened to be chilling at home in his new private recording studio with famed A Song of Ice and Fire YouTuber Alt X. So, after I told Dre my dilemma, he offered to fly out Kevin Pendragon and myself to his house to drop a hot track with Alt-Shift-X in order to help me explain some of the more nuanced aspect of this theory. And so without further ado, let's drop the beat. Illyrio clearly has affection for Aegon. He's really sad that he doesn't get to spend time with him. He praises him, gives him little gifts of his favorite food. He even has a chest of children's clothes in his home that may have been Aegon's when he was younger. Maybe Illyrio treats Aegon like this, because Aegon is his son. Aegon's Blackfire blood would come from Illyrio's now-dead wife, Sarah, who had pale golden hair streaked by silver, just like a Blackfire, and a name that sounds like a Targaryen or Blackfire name. Sarah may be this Blackfire survivor through the female line, and the mother of Aegon Blackfire with Illyrio. Illyrio deeply loved Sarah. He sacrificed a lot of political power and status to be with her, and after she dies of grayscale, he keeps her petrified stony hands as a keepsake, which is quite creepy, but it's also a clear expression of passionate love. And, which brings us back to Lord Varys. We are told when Varys was young, he was castrated and his private parts burned as part of some sort of arcane art. We've seen a similar blood magic ritual before, when Melisandre burned three leeches engorged with king's blood to cast a spell, which is why the mysterious man chose Lord Varys for his spell. Lord Varys is a black fire. fire. Melis' failed rebellion doomed the Band of Nine's entire mission. Remember, Westeros was just the first of many places they wanted to conquer. As for the Blackfire heirs, this is the first time after a failed rebellion there are no adults, only children. The Blackfire heirs were separated and sold, Varys to a mummer's troop, Sarah to a pillow house and lice. Graz Dan Moeros threatens Daenerys with a similar fate when she marches her unsullied to Yunkai. This may be a hint at the fate of the last female Blackfire. After all, they both happen to come from Lys, they both happen to end up with Illyrio and Pentos, and maybe Varys shaves his head to hide the pale blonde hair that he may share with Sarah. There's a hint for this in that another character who shaves his head bald is Egg in Duncan Egg. 
Egg shaves his head to hide his Valyrian blonde hair, and when Varys is introduced in the first book, he is plump, perfumed, powdered, and as hairless as an egg. Also, Supporting Varys' scheme to put the boy called Aegon on the Iron Throne would explain those depths of affection Illyrio mentioned to Tyrion. It's a fascinating theory, one that you can consider the dark version of R plus L equals J. It might even have been a promise me Ned sort of a situation. Maybe as Sarah was slowly dying of grayscale, she got her husband Illyrio to swear to honour her memory by granting her son his perceived birthright, the throne. All this stuff about debts of affection and the Blackfires and familial connections hint that there might be a deeper layer to Varys as a character. Maybe there's more to Varys than this cold, rational exterior. After all, he grew up with actors, he's a master of disguise, he talks endlessly about the power of illusion, and he says pretty explicitly that his role as a sly, unscrupulous spy is an act. Maybe behind the act, behind the illusions, behind the curtain is a man. Just a man with human passions. He wants revenge for the destruction of his family and the horrible life he had to lead because of it. Varys being the scion of a rival to House Targaryen also gives more credence to the theory that Young Griff is not Aegon Targaryen. Because if Varys was a Blackfire, then he would have no interest in Targaryen restoration. He would not seek to restore the house he helped to destroy. He would keep their name in their castle, but their bloodline must come to an end. Vengeance as a negative is one of this series. Vengeance major as a themes. negative is one of this series. Vengeance major as themes. a negative is one of this series major themes. We have seen several characters consumed and doomed by their thirst for vengeance. George Martin says the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. A cold, rational, scheming spider who manipulates politics and orchestrates wars for purely cold, rational reasons is not the human heart in conflict with itself. A much better story is that of a man who was born alone into the world, who was betrayed at a young age, who was cut and beaten and suffered, and so learned to cherish the family he had. A man who used illusion and deception to play the part of a passionless eunuch who only serves the realm, all the while secretly working over years and years out of love for his family. Imagine a sudden, tragic, bittersweet realization that this evil, scheming spider who stole and lied and started wars and killed good men who turned the whole damn realm into his puppet show did what he did out of love. One more little thing is that we're told that only the blood of the dragon would ever know the secrets of the Red Keep, specifically its secret passageways. And as it happens, Varys knows those secrets very well. Alright, after a half hour or so of this madness, I presume we're all tinned up enough to accept the following. Varys is a black fire. Young Griff is a black fire. The plan is to put a black fire on the throne, and Varys is staging a performance. This whole shebang is something he wants to be seen by somebody. But how does this tie into the Faceless Men, and where is that White Raven? Well, to start answering those questions, I'd like us to take a look at three different readings. One from the Mystery Knight, and two from the main A Song of Ice and Fire series. Underleaf glanced towards Dunk. The hanged man! It is good to see you moving about, sir. I feared I'd killed you. Will you do me a kindness and instruct my squire as to the nature of dragons? Will, give Sir Duncan the coin. Dunk had no choice but to take it. He unhorsed me. Must he make me caper for him too? Frowning, he hefted the coin in his palm, examined both sides, tasted it. Gold, not shaved or clipped. The weight feels right. I'd have taken it too, my lord. What's wrong with it? The king. Dunk took a closer look. The face in the coin was young, clean shaved, handsome. King Ares was bearded on his coins, the same as old King Aegon. King Daeron, who'd come between them, had been clean shaved, but this wasn't him. The coin did not appear worn enough to be from before Aegon the Unworthy. Dunk scowled at the word beneath the head. Six letters. They looked the same as he'd seen on other dragons. D-A-E-R-O-N, the letters read. But Dunk knew the face of Daeron the Good, and this wasn't him. 
When he looked again, he saw something was odd about the shape of the fourth letter. It wasn't... Damon! He blurted out. It says Damon. There never was any King Damon, though. Only... The Pretender. Damon Blackfire struck his own coinage during the rebellion. It's gold, though, Will argued. If it's gold, it should be as good as any of them other dragons, my lord. Compare that to the Feast for Crows prologue and Arya's time in the House of Black and White as Blind Beth. In an apple tree beside the water, a nightingale began to sing. It was a sweet sound, a welcome respite from the harsh screams and endless quirkings of the ravens that he had tended all day long. The white ravens knew his name and would mutter it to each other whenever they caught sight of him. Pay! 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 Until he wanted to scream. The big white birds were Archmaester Walgrave's pride. He wanted them to eat him when he died, but Pate half suspected that they meant to eat him too. Perhaps it was the fearsomely strong cider. He had not come here to drink, but Alaras had been buying to celebrate his copper link, and guilt had made him thirsty. But it almost sounded as if the nightingale were trilling. Gold for iron, gold for iron, gold for iron. Which was passing strange, because that was what the stranger had said the night Rosie brought the two of them together. Who are you? Pate had demanded of him, and the man had replied, An alchemist. I can change iron into gold. And then the coin was in his hand, dancing across his knuckles the soft yellow gold shining in the candlelight. On one side was a three-headed dragon, on the other, the head of some dead king. The corpses were laid out in the vault. The blind girl went to work in the dark, stripping the dead of boots and clothes and other possessions, emptying their purses and counting out their coins. Telling one coin from another by touch alone was one of the first things that the wave had taught her after they took away her eyes. The Bravosi coins were old friends. She need only brush her fingertips across their faces to recognize them. Coins from other lands and cities were harder, especially those from far away. Valentine honors were the most common, little coins, no bigger than a penny, with a crown on one side and a skull on the other. Lysine coins were oval and showed a naked woman. Other coins had ships stamped on them, or elephants, or goats. The Westerosi coins showed a king's head on the front and a dragon on the back. The old woman had no purse, no wealth at all, but for a ring on one thin finger. On the handsome man, she found four golden dragons out of Westeros. She was running the ball of her thumb across the most worn out of them, trying to decide which king it showed, when she heard the door opening softly behind her. So we can see here an interesting through line. A mysterious king on a golden dragon would appear to be Daemon. <laughs> And it's interesting to know that the House of Black and White has a fair amount of black fire gold on hand. The theory Preston puts together gets a little more elaborate, and I would encourage you to go watch that yourself, but I think the basic underpinnings here make sense. The same forces that have been fighting forever are still fighting. Turns out the greatest enemy of House Blackfire and of the Blackfire descendants themselves isn't actually the main part of House Targaryen, it's Bloodraven. Bloodraven himself has been the most voracious adversary of the Blackfires, doing things that even got him sent to the Wall by Aegon V. The Blackfires are certainly on his radar, and if there are any left, he definitely wants to exterminate them. But I think that Bloodraven is also on Varys' radar. In the world of Ice and Fire, it was common and popular knowledge that Bloodraven was a skin-changing, dark, evil wizard that hung out with a woman who allegedly bathed in blood to keep herself younger. 
Now, whether you believe Varys is accurately remembering his experience in which a fire consumed his genitals in some horrific calcifer-like incident and then began speaking to the practitioner of magic who had cut off said genitals, or you believe he is misremembering this, Varys himself is a self-proclaimed hater of magic. In my mind, if anyone's keeping tabs on evil dark wizards who are the archenemies of House Blackfire, it's probably Varys. And we have reason to suspect he's at least under the impression that magic exists, and he personally thinks it's something evil. And it is here where we re-enter the Preston Jacobs theory that Varys and the Illyrio cause have actually hired the House of Black and White to eliminate Bloodraven. This would not only explain how Jock and Hagar and his associates ended up in the Black Cells in the first place, but why they got placed with Yorin, and why they were going to the Wall. Alright, so the three big ideas we have going on here are that Varys and Aegon are both Blackfires, the Blackfire cause has hired the Faceless Men, and that in general Varys is staging a performance intended to be viewed. I would thus submit the White Ravens, and probably several other Ravens, but particularly the White Ravens, are Varys' conduit to Bloodraven, and Varys has the ability to put on stage in front of Bloodraven whatever he sees fit, in the same way that he has Kevin Lannister as a captive audience in the prologue chapter of A Dance with Dragons. In a way, Varys has Bloodraven as a captive audience as well, and this would make for a pretty epic story. And if Varys really is duping Bloodraven by staging a performance for him, I think this ties again very well into the way Varys acts in general as a character. So we're not only layering on the existing character elements and building towards an even more epic version of the character, but we're doing the same thing with the conflict. We're ramping up the Targaryen-Blackfire conflict and winding that into the general story. Now before we wrap up the video, I'd like to take a look at a few Cersei passages that I think show off many of the elements that I've been trying to highlight throughout this series. I forget nothing, she told him, thinking of a certain gold coin with a hand on one face and the f head of a forgotten king on the other. How did some miserable wretch of a jailer come to have such a coin hidden beneath his chamber pot? How does a man like Rugen come to have old gold from Highgarden? Cersei refused Mace Tyrell as well, and later Lancel. The others took the hint, and no one else approached her. Our fast friends and loyal lords, she could not even trust the Westermen, her father's sworn swords and bannermen. Not if her own uncle was conspiring with her enemies. Marjorie was dancing with her cousin Alla, Mega was Sir Talad the Tall, the other cousin, Eleanor, was sharing a cup of wine with the handsome young bastard of Driftmark, Aurain Waters. It was not the first time the queen had made note of Waters, a lean young man with gray-green eyes and long silver-gold hair. The first time she had seen him, for half a heartbeat, she had almost thought Rhaegar Targaryen had returned from the ashes. It is his hair, she told herself. He is not half as comely as Rhaegar was. His face is too narrow, and he has that cleft in his chin. The Valerians come from old Valyrian stock, however, and some of them have the same silvery hair as the Dragon Kings of old. Tommen returned to his seat to nibble at an apple cake. His uncle's place was empty. The Queen finally found him in a corner, talking intently with Mace Tyrell's son Garlan. What do they have to talk about? The Reach might call Sir Garlan gallant, but she trusted him no more than Marjorie or Loras. She had not forgotten the gold coin that Kyburn had discovered beneath the jailer's chamber pot. A golden hand from Highgarden. And Marjorie is spying on me. <sighs> when Sinel appeared to fill her wine cup, the queen had to resist the urge to take her by the throat and throttle her. Do not presume to smile at me, you treacherous little bitch. You will be begging me for mercy before I'm done with you. Now, we the reader know that Varys is Rugen, but the reason why I saved this for last and mentioned it here is it does exemplify lots of the stuff we've been talking about, but it also leads deep down another Preston Jacobs rabbit hole, and it does a great job examining the passages like this one and those surrounding it, and as you may have guessed, it reveals highly likely ties to House Blackfire, 
And so, while undoubtedly I have not touched on everything related to House Blackfire, I hoped I've pointed out a few unique things, and I've hoped I've done a decent job of trying to knit all this stuff together without repeating verbatim what's already been said. Part of the difficulty in making this series is the fact that there's so much good information out there already, and you really can just go watch that, and you should. But again, for now, I hope I've shined a few new lights on things, or brought a few new angles, or perhaps even mentioned a few things you hadn't heard about. In conclusion, it looks like Varys is in part putting on a performance for Bloodraven, continuing the old Blackfire Targaryen feud, and it seems likely that this latest Blackfire Rebellion will clash with a new Dance of the Dragons, as well as whatever terror and turmoil the others bring, and, you know, you're on. This again seems to be part of binding all the various pieces of the novel and side novellas together, as George gardens his way to a conclusion to A Song of Ice and Fire. I'd like to thank everyone for sticking through this series, as it's been kind of cut and paste and stop and start the whole time. I'd also like to thank all the creators who did readings for me for this video. They are wonderful people. Please go check out their YouTube channels listed below. And so, getting back into the swing of things, our next video will be focusing on the second of our two players. That's right, the often neglected and sometimes thought of as junior partner, Illyrio Mopatis. And so I hope you'll join me for part four, where we talk about Illyrio and probably a little bit about that barren guy from Dune. Again, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.